She works with others. She knows digital and source code better than anybody. And she called me about three months ago saying, what I found, I, I almost can't believe. And I felt sick to my stomach. She confessed the same thing. We both wanted chocolate chip cookies. We're on the phone. Oh. And what it is, in, in a nutshell, is that none of us are one person, one vote. We are all one person, a hundred, one hundredths of a vote. We are fractioned in the software that she found from 2001. We're not sure how far back it goes, but since 2001 in Diebold. Diebold and es and s have been owned together. They were started by brothers. Sequoia has been owned by Diebold Premier, now Dominion. So I call what you're about to hear an STD. They've all kissed, and it's a software transmitted disease. So now you're going to hear how deep it goes. There are 7,000 small voting jurisdictions all over America. State law controls elections. 7,000 jurisdictions within and among those states can have some say in process, procedure, private contractor to come and service your software, service your hardware. You kind of have to hire an IT guy who's a county employee, but they might not be the brightest bulb on the block. So you have to rely on these private contractors who know, you know, like the Mercedes-Benz dealership that, you know, we know Mercedes-Benz. You know, we know Diebold. We know us and s We're licensed for them. And they're, now you're going to hear, from Bev Harris, and you know, it's who, what, when, how, and why, and we're getting here, how. Bev Harris! Like this? Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. Do you need your pass? It's right there. Yeah. Phoebe, can you move your? I sure can. I can. Uh, I can get behind that. Oh, do, you, do you want to in your seat? You need your seat. You know, it's hard to shock me anymore, especially since I, over the past ten years after I found the Diebold files, have gone around the country and done field work. And I've chosen some of the most knowingly corrupt local locations because it was my idea that it would be a little easier to peel apart the onion if I could get into something that wasn't so high powered as a presidential election and I could see how they're doing this. And that has borne quite a bit of, few, of fruit. In, and it, by the way, electronic voting and the whole thing as Bob all this was way back in the 80s, maybe even the 60s that it started. But let's look at 2000 from there. In 2003, I stumbled upon the Diebold files. They were on a fairly obscure FTP server, downloaded seven CDs worth of files, didn't know what that meant, why I was finding them. And so I called, I don't know, Greg Palast. And I said, well, I don't know if it's legal if I download these, and I don't know what's in them. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, well, you know, if what's in them is pretty bad, they're going to throw the book at you. Yeah. But if what's in them is really bad, probably not too much will happen to you. <laughs> well, what was in them was really bad. But... I didn't know how bad, and you know, the thing is when you get large uh, dumps of information like you see with WikiLeaks and all that, a lot of it has, it evolves over time as more information comes through. In 2010, I did one of my local deals and I went to Memphis, Tennessee because they had an odd election whereby um, really very primarily densely African-American Memphis had and, and Democratic had decided to vote in a, com a complete slate of white Republicans. <laughs> and there were 10 black Democratic candidates that sued and because of that we were able to get discovery and during the course of getting to the discovery, we ended up with something we never expected to get. Now they obstructed every single thing they could obstruct. 
I was so frustrated that finally, I, and I went there with Susan Pinchon, for any of you who saw Hacking Democracy, she's the wonderful woman who cried at the end. She's also a marvelous investigator and activist. Well, we went there and I said, you know, uh, they're not giving us anything. Let's just ask them for a list of the file names on their own computers. I mean, I don't even know what that would do, you know. So we said, okay, we want you, 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 and you. Tell us the list of names of files on your computer. We come in and they are loading their computers onto carts that have wheels on them, running out the door with them, stuffing in cars and driving away. And so, happened to have a good judge at the time. He came down to the facility. He said there was only one that hadn't driven away by that time. He said, bring that thing in here. Let's open it up. They had erased it at 5.15 in the morning. We're like, well, it must be good, whatever is on them. So, the judge said, you know, I bet you guys have backup drives. Why don't you give those to me and we'll put them in the bosom of the court until the trial. Well, they did. They're on these old-fashioned mag tapes, and there was five of them. And we got them a day before the file, lots of time to prepare, and they were encrypted. So there was nothing we could do. They then switched out the judge, got a white Republican judge in there, and he said, oh, this is not interesting, and he dismissed the case. Well, you, one of my favorite quotes, Richard Hayes Phillips, when he went to look at the Ohio ballots, he said, and they would say, well, the election's over. Get over it. And he said, you know, I'm a historian. I have all the time in the world. Oh, yeah. So we, yeah, the court date was over. Encrypted files. They took him into a local place to see if they, they said, we can't even get at it. I made contact with someone in Europe. You know with which kind of organization, anonymous. And they de-encrypted the files. When you've seen some things where they know how to do an SQL and, and tamper the voter database, they do know because they have copies of the voter registration database, same thing I have. They have the same thing I found. Now, it's still kind of sat there. I mean, God, now I'm going through five hard drives full of information. I get all the voter registration lists going back to 10 years. I can see that they've taken 13,000 black voters and made them white. I can, oh, that's part of the deal. I can see that they've taken 11,000 voters all black and said they, don't, they no longer voted, even though they did, because there it is. And so they can be purged. Lots of games like that. I can see that they took the electronic poll books and they changed the stuff that was in the electronic poll books so that, so that people who had asked for a Democratic ballot were said to have asked for a Republican ballot and voted Republican. Uh, so there was this massive messing around with this stuff. Guess who I was up against? I was up against a guy who is now, he's a, he's a brilliant lawyer. He is now the chief counsel for the Republican National Committee, and they say they're going to tap him to become the chair. Now, in Shelby County, it's a microcosm of what's happening in the United States. Make sure you say it's not the Shelby upholder. Shelby County, Tennessee. Two Shelbys both have racial problems. But Shelby County, Tennessee has a problem. If you're white and Republican, you don't have enough of you to win. And you have to make yourself get power. They have taken total control of that county for 10 years now, and it's a mystery to everyone. So we move forward to 2014. They have an election. It's a very odd election. Judge Joe Brown from TV is running. He's decided he's going to run for local prosecutor. Now, if you want to believe this, uh, Memphis, which is mostly black and Democrat, decided they would like to be prosecuted by the white Republican. <laughs> but in comes a guy who has a little bit of political acumen, Benny Smith, his name is. And Benny Smith has three areas of expertise that we needed for this, to crack this case. He has political acumen, so he knows how you would rig an election. He has database development acumen, so he knows how databases are constructed. And he has accounting acumen. He moves around billions of dollars with lots of decimal places every day in his real world job. He said, you know, I don't think that it could be tampered, but there's an anomaly in Judge Joe Brown's race. It's one off. It's as if two plus two equals five. Bigger numbers, one off. How does that happen? If you add up 10 votes,
But those votes are 2.5 votes and 7.5 votes. The two rounds up to three, seven rounds up to eight, three plus eight is 11, you get one off. He sees this stuff every day in working with money. It's a problem when you start decimalizing things because you get these little fractions and they sometimes combine and make it one off. He found 22 rounding errors all in the criminal justice system elections. So he said, you know, I, I want to look at those files you got back from Europe. And I'm going to look for one thing, and I don't think I'm going to find it because how could I possibly find it? But I'm going to see if it decimalizes the counting of the vote. And because he knows how to do databases, he knew what computer instructions it, to look for exactly and where to look for them. To his amazement, the first thing he saw was to treat and count every vote as a fraction of a vote. Mm -hmm. Now what that means is, instead of one person, one vote, you can be a half a vote, you can be 2.5 votes, you can be a 50th of a vote. So, he thought, well, let me see if I can take this actual vote database, because we've got tons of those on those files, these actual votes, and let me see if I can just tell it Okay, give this guy 70% and give this guy 24.6% and see if it reallocates all their votes. It did. It took four seconds. So then he contacted me and he said, I think we have a problem here. And I said, do you think just, just in, in Memphis, is that just where it is? He goes, no, I think this is in every single system in America. So I said, well, I got at least 40 databases from real elections. Let me look. It was in every database in every race, in every single state, where they were running this system. He gave me the script, I showed Mimi, it's just the awfulest feeling because you can go so precisely, what you can do is say, in this precinct, for the voters that are black only, I would like in this race for them to get me counted as three-fifths of a vote, and in this race, Wow, that's a tough race. We better only count them as like a, a, a fifth of a vote. It is that precise. So I said, well, Benny, we, we know it was in there. Could it be a glitch? No, they had to put it in there. So I said, well, if it's in there, if it's counting votes as fractions, this has to be somewhere documented because they have to be certified. So they had to at least lie or do something sort of so that if anyone asked them, there'd have to be some kind of a reference. 2001. June 27, 2001, one-liner. We um, made a change so that we could do weighted races. Weight. W-E-I-G-H-T. So we began to peel that back, and this is really still really unfolding. So here is what happened. In the 1980s, as well as all the other stuff with the Eurosurvets brothers and all that, there was a law firm. One of its senior partners is a guy named Eigel Crow, Bud Crow, the head of the Watergate Plumbers Unit. One, their programmer and their accountant was a guy named Jeffrey Dean. <laughs> Jeffrey Dean got in trouble because some of the, firm, the law firm's partners got upset because they said, you're writing checks to yourself. And he claimed in his testimony, well, I was paying, you know, he's a liar, so you don't know. He said, I was paying myself because me and some of the law firm partners had a project going we didn't tell the other law firm partners about. This is in his sworn testimony. Well, his, the project they weren't telling other people about, I don't know, but I can tell you who the clients of this law firm were. King County, which is the largest county in, in Washington State, the Washington State Democratic Party. Okay? Jeffrey Dean takes the fall. He's very pissed off later on when they ask him about why you why did you you plead guilty? He says, I did not plead guilty. It was an Alfred plea. I did not steal that money. It was compensation for something we were doing. I'm not Lily White, but well, he is Lily White. He lives in Idaho now, in Riggins, Idaho. But at any rate, he goes to jail. He takes the fall. 1992. 
He comes out in 1996. Don't you think it's odd in 1992 when he goes to jail that King County Elections hires his brother and his wife to do their absentee program? That's just odd. He gets out in 1996 with $67 in his pocket and somehow he flies off to Belgium and buys two printers that are super high end and they're worth a million dollars each. He pays two million dollars. Somebody made sure he had this money. And in 1996, before he's even out of prison, he's on work release, he is hired to help work with the absentee program in King County. In 1996 also, he then starts a ballot printing plan, immediately gets the contract to print the ballots for King County. And in 2000, he purchases or he sells his ballot company to global election systems. But he doesn't actually, it doesn't actually work like that. They actually, it, I don't know, there must be some name lawyers know, but essentially he got all, uh, most of the stock. So he got a, a pile of money and then he became the main stockholder for global elections. But sadly for him, because his wife now owned, uh, she owed $2 million for these printers and he owed 385000 in restitution and was going to go to jail if they didn't, if he didn't come up with this. Um, global elections was insolvent and didn't have any of the cash to pay. So he's sitting on a pile of stock that is worthless, and along comes 2001, March. California allocates $300 million to buy new voting systems. And in June, just coincidentally, all of the programmers and the salespeople, there's only five or something, are suddenly waylaid. They say, stop whatever you're doing. We have a deadline. We have to get something completely rewritten in the program. They deliver it with two hours to spare. What did they deliver? weighted races. Two days later, they received a check for $5 million, took care of his problems. Check came from Diebold Inc. Now I wonder who had the design specs. Who said you have to do this? This stuff isn't something that I made up. In fact, let me read you. The design specs. It's worse than even we thought. We're holding a vote by mail election. The hitch is each voter is apportioned a value or weight for their vote. To make things even more interesting, the rules for the weights vary by race. So voter X might be given weight 5 for race A and weight 12, weight 12 for race B. And then goes through these specifications of all the different ways they want to do this. And then it says the solution, this is worse than we thought, is to print a barcode on each ballot to identify each voter. The high-speed central count absentee scanner scans the barcode, looks up the weight for the voter for each race on the ballot, and passes that information to the counter in the central tabulator Jones. And then they go on to say, it's going to add up pretty quick, a lot of significant digits, potentially millions of dollars for us. Yeah, what are we reading from? This is an email between one of the owners of Global Election Systems and their programming staff. So that's basically where we're at. And I think we can guess what was going on here. They were having to create a system that, as they say in the Shark Tank, is scalable. Something where everybody could do the alteration of the races very quickly and easily and precisely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Beth Harris, ladies and gentlemen.